We're sitting in Superior, Wisconsin today, and we want to have a conversation about um, some events that are going on in Indian Country across uh, North America, really. There's been uh, some emphasis in the last few months about suicides in Native communities. And uh, we want to have a little conversation about that topic today here uh, in, in order to, uh, to feel out some of your thoughts about this subject because uh, you're what they're terming uh, a survivor. That is someone in your family somehow you're affiliated with, and as a doctor, I suspect that uh, you've got a number of stories you might be able to share with us today. A survivor of suicide in that someone in your family committed suicide and you've had to deal with the trauma. So I'd like to first start out by saying, uh, could you do me a little bit of an introduction about uh, who you are, clan, tribal affiliation, and what you're doing today, and we can get that on the record. Ujukatinishinabeg <laughs> Uh, first greetings to my elders, uh, uh, fellow Ojibwe people, and fellow human beings. Um, my name is uh, Arnie Vainio, Dr. Vainio. My Ojibwe name is Ogamabanez, and um, I'm, my clan is Eagle. I'm enrolled on the Mille Lacs Reservation. My wife, <coughs> Ivy, and I have a son, Jacob. We live in Duluth, and I work on the Fond du Lac Reservation in uh, Cloquet, Minnesota, and I'm a family practice physician there and have been there for the past 13 years. Let's go back to what happened in your family first. Let's start there. Let's start there and talk a little bit about that because I know that's, that's not going to be an easy subject. I don't think it's easy for anyone to talk about friends and relatives who have passed on and the more trauma associated with some of these events. Tell me a little bit about what you remember about losing your father. Well, my father, my father committed suicide when, um, in 1963, July 17th, 1963, actually exactly 35 years before my son was born. And um, I was just shy of my fifth birthday and he had a, um, he and my mom had a, a, a tavern. It was called the Good Luck Tavern, of all things. And um, he, did, he, he wasn't a good businessman. He, if, for instance, uh, rented a truck one time. He always had these get-rich-quick schemes. My mom was telling me that he rented a truck one time, and he went to South Dakota, and he bought potatoes, and he was going to come back and sell these 100-pound sacks of potatoes and, uh, and get rich and make a lot of money selling those things. But nobody had any money. so. You know, somebody came up to him and, you know, couldn't afford a sack of potatoes but needed it, and he gave that sack away, then he gave another one away, and he gave another one away, and, and eventually he gave those, all of them away and didn't make any money and, and lost money. And I suspect the bar was probably the same sort of a business. And um, he was drinking, and my mom said he was taking some sort of tranquilizers at the time and depressed and getting into fights. and. And he'd threatened suicide a few other times. And the day that he finally committed suicide, he walked through the bar, through the good luck, and he had a gun, and he, he said he was going to shoot himself. And there was a, a woman at the bar that, um, you know, that was a regular customer there and, and knew him and knew my mother. And uh, as he was walking out, she said, those goddamn Finlanders don't have the guts to shoot themselves. And, you know, that's probably what he was thinking about. He went across the, went across the road uh, and he shot himself. And, you know, that, that has repercussions for me even now. And, and, and there seriously isn't, you know, a week that goes by ever that I don't think about that, that I don't put that into the context of what's happening in my life right now. You know, would he, you know, as a physician, you know, certainly he'd be, he would be proud of that. And, you know, as a dad, 
I think everybody wants their kids to have it better than they had it. And, you know, as a father and a husband, you know, my father's suicide affects me a lot. I think about that, you know, every time I have to discipline my son, every time, you know, my wife and I disagree about something, you know, I, I really think about that. And I think about what's important. As a physician, I see end-of-life issues all the time. You know, we are involved in turning off ventilators, end-of-life decisions. You know, there's times when we can't save people. There's cancers and things that, you know, we have a limited lifespan. And, and um, you know, I'm involved in that quite a bit. And because of that, because of my position in that and talking to patients that are dying, they tell me things that they wouldn't even tell their family. And I am extremely well aware of what's important. And, um, and it is family. You know, it's my family that's so important. And I think about, you know, my dad, you know, when I was four, you know, I know my son so well and, and the things that he suffers with and thinks about in school, I know exactly what he's thinking. You know, and I, I would think that my dad would have to have thought those same things. And it, it's hard for me to think that he could walk away from that. And, um, but suicide, you know, when people are, you know, people are hurting, and I, and I see suicidal people. In the Native community, they talk a lot about the historical trauma as being part of the impact. Um, you're a doctor, and I suspect that you're living a fairly healthy lifestyle, mm -hmm. physically and mentally, because of the tools you have available. Mm -hmm. As the thought of suicide ever passed through your mind yourself as a way out or as some kind of a solution or or does your experience weigh in the other direction when you think of that well you know i don't think about it now but but i was overtly suicidal when i was in my late teens and um i started you know i grew up around alcohol and you know, every Saturday, every Friday, Saturday night at our house when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, was, you know, drunken aunts slobbering on you and who loves you more and and uh, stupid drunk talk and um, hangovers in the morning and fights and, you know, fights all night long and people throwing things in the house and, and uh, screaming at each other and calling each other names. And, you know, I thought, when I was a little kid, I thought I would never touch alcohol. You know, to, to be that stupid... And, um, but I started drinking when I was 13 or 14 years old and I actually drank with my uncle and my mother and, you know, my mom had this, she wasn't a bad mom, she was a good mom and, you know, after my dad's suicide, you know, she had all these kids that, and she, you know, she eventually had, she had five, four of us by my, by my dad and she had two more kids after she remarried and, and, um, you know, and after my dad's suicide, she wanted to keep us as busy as possible, so we swam a lot, and we went, you know, did a lot of different things, and, you know, poor people things, because we didn't have any money, but mostly swimming in the rivers and things like that, but, you know, she, even when I was, I don't know, 13 or so, she had this logic that I was going to drink anyway, so if I drank, I might as well drink with her, and, you know, that was so empowering, and, um, you know, to be able to drink with adults, and, and it, you know, that was, uh, I liked it. And it, to be accepted into that, you know, adult world like that. Um, and I drank with my uncle. My uncle used to, he took an interest in me after my, after my dad died, and I would, I would have done anything for him. And I, I tell people that if he was a bank robber, that's what I'd be right now as a bank robber. He used to wake me up at two, three o'clock in the morning, and he just, all he'd have to do is just, just touch my shoulder and say, Arnie, and I was up, and I didn't care where we were going as long as I was with him, and we used to net fish and shine deer and, you know, shoot deer at night, and, and, you know, I have all these ways that I know now how to avoid game wardens, and we'd make our fish traps out of rusty wire so they couldn't see it from airplanes, and, and, um, and he was teaching me these things, but, but the, you know, but he was teaching me, and, you know, and for me to start drinking with him we used to we used to spear fish on the and legally but um you know go spearing fish from a fish house on on lakes 
and you know we'd leave at four o'clock in the morning and we'd be there just when the sun rose and and you know we'd be drinking blackberry brandy and peppermint schnapps and beer all day long when I was you know 13 14 years old and and you know as I started drinking more and more um, you know whenever I got drunk I think about my dad and so during this time of empowerment the alcohol not only empowered you as a young man but you reminisced in a way oh, yeah. about what was going on and not necessarily positively no it, and you know I, I could never think about my father and his death when I was sober because it was just it was just too hard you know but then you know when I was drinking then that's mostly what I thought about and you know and I would drink and cry and and uh, think about suicide and think that maybe you know that I was responsible for his death and that was the biggest thing even as a little kid I always thought that I was responsible I was too much of a burden and you know bills and having to feed kids and and all that stuff and 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 I really did think that and when I was I don't know maybe 16 years old to 20 you know then I thought about suicide a lot and when I was maybe 17 18 years old then you know for I don't know three months better part of a summer you know, I was actually, I was overtly suicidal. And I had a, a, a roadrunner, this really fast car, and, and I was thought that, you know, and I, and I really did think that, you know, I'd go out in just a flaming wreck, and, and you know, I'd get the high school annual dedicated to me, and, you know, people would remember me forever, and I'd be a hero. And, you know, and, you know I don't know how I, I could think that, but, but I did. You know, and my my father's suicide put so much hurt on me and my brothers and sisters and my mother and and everybody around us. But you know, I mean, that's that's the way I thought, and and um, it, you know, and it, that could have happened any time during that you know that summer. Would didn't. would you attribute a great deal of people's slide into actually committing suicide? Very much related to alcohol and drug use in the native community. Oh, I th you know, I think so. And um, you know, alcohol and drugs. You know, they start out numbing things, and and um, you know, as I was growing up after my dad's suicide, you know, and you know, to think about that when you're, you know, to think about it when you're sober and thinking right, is very very hard to do. You know, but as soon as you you lose some of that inhibition with, you know, with alcohol, and I was certainly using drugs then too, and uh, mostly marijuana, but experimented with just about everything else I could get my hands on, and um, you know, I I was I was not suicidal unless I was drinking or using, and um, you know, from a personal standpoint, yeah, they're connected. My father was drinking heavily, you know, during the time that he was suicidal, he was probably drinking when he was when he shot himself. You know, he had a bar and, and uh, you know, I mean, it was just alcohol and, and um, drinking. That was just a way of life. You've embraced a lot of Native traditions uh, during your lifetime and during your, your growth period. You went through some rough times drinking, mm -hmm. um, going to school and, and not going to school because yeah. you've, you failed there. Mm -hmm. um, has tell me about embracing native traditions how is that a helpful uh situation to infuse into the native community is is that is that suicide prevention yes and you know th th there are so many things that are suicide prevention but you know coming back to my traditions saved me and um and there's a few other things but that's one of the big things and and my mother was um she was Mede. And she went to ceremonies, and, and my my grandfather, going back to historical trauma, my grandfather was taken from his family and put into a into a Catholic boarding school. He was beaten for speaking his language. He was beaten for practicing his traditions. And even though he was a fluent speaker, he would he would define things for us. If we asked him what something meant, he would say it, but he would never speak Ojibwe around us. And he wouldn't speak Ojibwe around my mom. And when she was growing up, he didn't want her learning traditional things because of the hurt that would bring on her. And um, in order for her to do her, practice her traditional beliefs, she ran away from home when she was 15 years old. And she was extremely traditional. And, and I was, as I was growing up and, you know, during the times that she was trying to teach me things, 
was the time that I was drinking, and you know, and I was pretty wild, and didn't, um, you know, I didn't listen to the things that I should have, and but somehow I think there's a lot of that stuff comes back, and sometimes it comes back to me at times that I don't expect it, that I remember something that she said or things that she would do, and and um, maybe you didn't listen to her, but you still heard her. I think so, you know, and I think there, I think there's a lot of that. I think, you know, now we worry that maybe our kids aren't listening to us, but maybe they are. And if you look at a lot of the elders that, that people look up to, um, you know, any good alcohol counselor has been at the bottom. You know, they've been rock bottom, they've been drunk, they've been, you know, they've lost everything. And those are the people that really understand where people are coming from. You know, for, from, from a suicide standpoint, you know, people that have been there, I think, are the ones that, you know, that best understand that. But but suicide prevention happens, you know, it's not just people that have been suicidal that are good at that. And, and I talk to people about, about suicide, and even with my own, um, even with talking about this, and even with talking about suicide in public and on film and, and other things, when I talk about it, it's hard. And I was at, uh, we were showing Walking Into the Unknown, we were showing the film at a church uh, last fall sometime. And, you know, the, the feedback we get when we show that film is so powerful and so positive that uh, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's humbling. But, um, but at the end of it, there was a guy that came up that was in his maybe 60s, early 70s with a cane, two canes. He was having a hard time walking. But he was there when my father committed suicide. And he told me that. And, you know, I didn't know that there was anybody left alive to talk to about that. And, you know, as much as I've talked about this and want to know about things, I couldn't talk to him about it. You know, I can't mix my highs and, that, and my lows like that. And I still, I still have a talk to him. You know, I need to get a hold of him. And, you know, it was, that was hard, you know, knowing that he was there and, you know, wanting that information, but at the same time, not wanting that information. And, um, you know, and I do need to, I do need to go and talk to him about that because, you know, I do need to understand some things better. You deal as a doctor with people, uh, end of life decisions, mm -hmm. um, no matter how much you prepare for those situations, there's still a remorse, mm -hmm. um, life. Uh, ending it as we know it. I mean, it goes with lots of living things. You mm -hmm. mentioned having to put uh, one of your pets down. Yeah. And despite the fact that it's probably for good reasons, there's a remorse. Mm -hmm. Suicide doesn't allow you for any planning. It doesn't allow you for any what you, what you call it. You're, you're, you're trying to make sense of why it all happened. Um, someone getting old and passing away, you can uh, think about those things and almost plan for them and almost be relieved. Mm -hmm. the person's out of pain and so forth. And yet it seems like suicide's just the opposite of that. It just, it's, it's so sudden that it takes people. You're talking about this how many years later? Oh. So how many years has it been? 48. 48 years, mm -hmm. still difficult to talk about at times. I can, I can feel it in you. I can feel that there's times when it brings back some feelings that are unresolved yet. Mm -hmm. You counsel people all the time? I do. And um, what do you tell them? What do you tell them? Well, you know, when somebody's suicidal, you know, nobody, nobody really wants to end their life. And, you know, there have been people that have, made suicide attempts, jumping off of bridges, things like that, that actually survived. And, um, you know, and on the way down, realized what was actually happening and, you know, and lived through that and, and, you know, realized that, you know, they didn't want, they didn't want to end their life. They didn't want to die. What they wanted was they wanted pain to end. And it's a balance, you know, that, you know, all of us carry, you know, we carry these weights, we carry relationship difficulties, we carry financial difficulties, you know, raising kids, all the stresses that we have, you know, and at some point, 
you know, for for whatever reason, those stresses become too hard, you know, and in the, the balance tips. And when people are suicidal, you know, they just want that to end. And, you know, if somebody has a, it kicks up the risk when somebody actually has a plan and they have the means to do it. If somebody's going to take pills and they have pills, you know, that's that's a higher risk than somebody that has a vague sort of a plan or, you know, tell somebody, what if I'd never been here at all? And, um, you know, and, and, and that, you know, if somebody even says that sort of stuff, it's nothing to take lightly, but it's not as high risk as if somebody, you know, has a plan or, you know, oftentimes when people are, when they commit suicide, it's, people don't see it coming because somebody that's been depressed and sad all of a sudden starts to feel good. You know, they start giving away possessions. They start laughing. They start smiling. And Everyone's thinking, oh, the guy's coming out of it or right. the person's coming out of it. Yeah, and when actually, you know, they've resolved a plan, you know, and, you know, they know that their pain is going to end pretty soon. And, you know, but... Are, th are those pleas for help talking about, talking about suicide? Your father walked through the bar with a gun. Mm -hmm. Was he crying out for help at that oh, moment? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and, you know, and people, you know, whenever they do something like that, whenever they mention that, whenever they, you know, even giving things away, even changing, you know, starting maybe high-risk behaviors and things like that, um, you know, those are, those are signals for somebody to please help me. And, you know, they, and they might not even be aware of that themselves. But, you know, if, you know, it's letting somebody know and, you know, getting a call from somebody that's suicidal, you know, for a physician is not easy. And, you know, and even for a therapist or any, anybody that deals with that professionally, you know, those aren't easy conversations. And for somebody to get that, you know, from a, you know, from a cousin or somebody, you know, out of the blue, that would be a scary conversation. But you need to have that conversation if somebody calls because, you know, if somebody calls on you and lets you know they're suicidal, they're doing that because they trust you, you know, because they know that, you know, you have their best interests at heart and, you know, and that you'll do something for them, you know. And, and that something is, you know, it's not giving somebody advice. It's not telling somebody that, you know, oh, that's not a bad enough problem. You know, whatever problem it is, it's bad enough if somebody's thinking about it, you know, it, and that's the time to not be judgmental. That's the time to, you know, to, to listen. You don't have to give advice. You don't have to tell somebody what to do. What you need to do is listen. You know, they're calling you because they want you to listen. And, you know, and bartering for time is a reasonable thing to do. You know, buying 24 hours, buying a week, you know, getting them 24 hours beyond that. And, you know, then another 24 hours. You know, that might make the difference between, you know, between life and death. My father's suicide has repercussions for my entire family 48 years later. And, um... Children without a grandfather. Oh, sure. To you be know. around. Yep. And our children are impacted by it more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Children, young teenagers in Indian country. You've got uh, teenagers in your household. Uh, mm -hmm. You're pretty close, right? Oh, yeah. 12 year old. And when you look at that, you know that they're at high risk when you look at the data. What do we do to focus some attention on that? How do we hear their cry? Is it different than an adult? Well, they are somewhat different. You know, if you look at, if you look at the rest of the population, if you look at Caucasian people, you know, the people that commit suicide are elderly men. You know, but they're not in, in Native communities. In Native communities, it's our kids. And... Um, you know, there is a, it being, being different is, is a very hard thing. And, um, and Native kids are, you know, they feel different. All kids, when they go through puberty, you know, even really smart kids, that, you know, they're, even if they're really smart, their mind goes from this straight road to a super highway with, with all of this self-awareness coming in and all of these thoughts coming in and all of their thoughts about what their place is in, you know, in their peer groups. And, you know, it's not unusual for kids to think that they're, that they're different and everybody's looking at them. But if you actually are different, you know, if you're native in an area when, where there's a lot of, not a, a lot of native kids or, um, you know, even having suicide in your family, having alcoholism in your family, having any of those things in your family, you know, you, you start to think about that. And um, that's what happened to me when I was 13. You know, I, I started, you know, drinking at the same time I was going through puberty and, 
you know, having all these thoughts of self-awareness coming in and, and you know, thinking that, that I was actually different. And I remember times when um, once we were, my brothers and I were, lived in a country, so, you know, our entertainment was riding bikes around, and we, were, we had these, we were picking big rocks up, as big as we could carry, the size of a horse's head, and throwing them off of a bridge and seeing how high we could splash, you know, get a splash out of the water. And, you know, this guy came by that I respected, that was, you know, I looked up to because he had a fast car, and he was, you know, we were maybe, I don't know, 12 years old, something like that, and he was old enough to have a car, and he had this really cool car, and he stopped, and um, as we were carrying a big rock, my brother and I were carrying this rock that was so big that we had to both carry it, and he, and he stopped his car, and he said, you goddamn Indians will steal anything, won't you? And, and that came back to me when I was drinking, and when I was suicidal, and, you know, and I, I still remember that like it was yesterday, and, you know, how could somebody you know, that I looked up to say something that hurtful and think it was funny. And, um, you know, and that's the kind of stuff that, you know, people perseverate on and dwell on. And, and um, you know, there's a lot of hurt. And it's historical. If you look at historical trauma or any of those things, you know, there's a lot of reasons for people that have never been, I was never in boarding school, you know, and it wasn't even my mother, it was my grandfather that was in boarding school. But his experience in boarding school affected the way I looked at the world and it still affects the way I look at the world now. What should we be doing to help prevent suicide in the native community? What can what can I and my friends and relatives and things what what would you suggest? What can we do to help prevent suicide in our community? You know, we need to take an interest in our kids and you know and I'm not saying that like you know, making sure they get macaroni and that stuff. I mean, like making sure we that, that we understand them, that we, my suicide prevention thing with my son is we go to breakfast every single Saturday morning. And I take my brother with me. I take any of Jacob's friends that'll come with us. Um, and we have breakfast, you know, and it's just a guy thing. And we, you know, we talk and we, we climb a tower and throw parachute guys off the top and we make paper airplanes and, you know, we, whatever we do guy stuff and um but the fact is you know we talk about things and we've talked about suicide and and they know that as they get older that they can talk to me about anything that i'll talk to them and one of them one of jacob's friends even said um one time he said uh said aren't you're like a dad to me and he doesn't have a dad with him and and he said you know someday jacob and i will be taking you to breakfast and that's what i want you know, that's exactly what I want. And, and he gets it. So yeah. it's, and it's not so much quantity. It sounds more like quality. Well, it's quality and quantity. You know, there was that whole quality time thing back in the 70s. And, you know, it's quality and it's quantity. You know, I, I answer questions. You know, when, when those boys ask me questions, if it's about sex or, you know, photosynthesis or whatever it might be, you know, I don't beat her on the bush. We talk about things. You know, where do babies come from? You know, in our house, babies never came from a stork or under a cabbage patch. You know, we talk about where babies come from. You know, and I want those guys to know that, you know, someday that if they, if they hear something, that they didn't hear it different from me before, because as soon as that happens, I betray them. You know, and, you know, betrayal from an adult isn't, is something a kid should never have. You know, if you look at our gang problems and things like that, you know, why do kids get in gangs? They get in gangs because, you know, because somebody's got their back. We need to have those kids' back. You know, it's us. Dr. Vanio, I want to thank you for taking some time to be with us today. I, I appreciate it. And uh, if there was any one last message to the world in regards to this issue you would like to say, um, you know, you know, I, I think about, you know, as a physician right now, you know, I know my dad would still be alive. You know, he was finished. Finns live forever. They, you know, they, you know, my grandfather died at 92. My grandmother died at 89. My dad would be 85 right now. You know, he'd be alive and he'd still be, I think, pretty sharp. And, you know, he missed all of that. And, you know, at, 
it was financial stuff. A lot of it was failing bar business and all that, you know. And and he he committed suicide when hamburger was thirty nine cents a pound and gas was nineteen cents a gallon, you know. And who knows how much money was really involved? Eight hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, five thousand dollars. You know, as a physician, I could write a check right now. I mean, right on the spot, that would save my father. But I don't know if it would have. You know, if that was it. You know, it's not. It's not that. It's not fixing problems necessarily. It's listening. It's being there. We need to be there for our people. And life is worth living. Life is worth living. Miigwech. Miigwech to you.